The name Joseph McCarthy is synonymous with the term witch hunt. Yet McCarthyism, the anti-communist witch hunt to which he gave his name, could be argued to have started in 1947, when McCarthy was only a newly elected junior senator for Wisconsin. Joe McCarthy didn't start the fire. In 1946 and 1947, the US was preparing for nuclear war, for annihilation. Nuclear tests were being conducted in the South Pacific at Bikini Atoll. Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9835, also known as the Loyalty Order, and this was put in place in order to screen federal employees for association with fascist, totalitarian, or communist organisations. At the same time, Truman launched the Truman Doctrine, a foreign policy objective committed to preventing Soviet and communist expansion. Several years later, with the unmasking of Soviet agents such as Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and Klaus Fuchs, who had worked on the Manhattan Project, as well as strong anti-communist rhetoric from right-wing figures such as Walter Winchell, what emerged was a paranoia about communism, about the Soviet Union, about the Communist Bloc and Red China, one which would shatter the lives of hundreds of individuals. Most famously, it resulted in the Hollywood blacklist, which included such famous figures as Paul Robeson, as well as playwright and third husband of Marilyn Monroe and successor to Joe DiMaggio, Arthur Miller. Others included Dorothy Parker, Edward G. Robinson, Richard Attenborough, and of course, Charlie Chaplin. This coincided with a wave of over-the-top red-baiting films such as the Doris Day and Ronald Reagan starring Storm Warning, and The Red Danube, featuring Angela Lansbury, who was in fact a lifelong socialist. But perhaps the whole Red Scare, McCarthyism, would never have happened. Perhaps we would never have heard of Joe McCarthy. Perhaps all those people in Hollywood may not have been blacklisted, if it weren't for one particular investigation by Congress, by the House Un-American Activities Committee and the actions of one man, one member of Congress behind the scenes pulling the strings. So far in this introduction, I have mentioned Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, not Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio, as well as Joe McCarthy. So who comes next? And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Oh, yeah. You were. And I can prove it. Because I've got your confession right here. Richard Milhouse Nixon, henceforth referred to as Milhouse because, well, funny. Everything's coming up Milhouse! Has gone down in history as the second worst president in the United States. Thanks to, you know, the whole Watergate scandal thing. Hunter S. Thompson said after Milhouse's death in 1994, Richard Nixon was an evil man. Evil in a way that only those who believe in the physical reality of the devil can understand. He was utterly without ethics or morals or any bedrock sense of decency. He was a cheap crook and a merciless war criminal who bombed more people to death in Laos and Cambodia than the U.S. Army lost in all of World War II. And he denied it to the day of his death. When students at Kent State University in Ohio protested the bombing, he connived to have them attacked and slain by troops from the National Guard. Thompson also said this, It poisoned our water forever. Nixon will be remembered as a classic case of a smart man shitting in his own nest. But he also shed in our nests. And that was the crime that history will burn on his memory, like a brand. <laughs> 
by disgracing and degrading the presidency of the United States, by fleeing the White House like a diseased cur, Richard Nixon broke the heart of the American dream. Okay, so that's the view of one person. One person who spent most of his life on drugs. But the consensus is pretty much the same. Nixon was... Nixon was a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. In 1948, Nixon was returned to the California Congressional District unopposed. And why? Because he won both the Democratic and the Republican primaries by using a hugely undemocratic process known as cross-filing, whereby fuck democracy. Then again, every political candidate in California at the time was up to this, so fuck democracy, I guess. Nixon tried it again in 1950, but he lost the Democratic primary to Helen Gagan Douglas, inspiration for Snow White's evil queen, and who was openly having an affair with Lyndon B. Johnson. Nixon, a self-confessed and virulent anti-communist, teamed up with fellow Democratic runner-up, Manchester Body, to vilify Gagan. With a little help from the oil barons, and funding from a certain future president, by the name of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Mirror, mirror, let me see, who's the fairest in D.C.? Oh, I will see you again, Kennedy. From the grassy knoll. <laughs> he was also a close correspondent of Donald Trump throughout the 1980s and one of Trump's inspirations. As we know, Trump took directly from the Nixon Electoral Playbook. See California 1950, Helen Gagan Douglas. The Un-American Activities Committee had been set up in May of 1938 to investigate alleged disloyalty to the United States. Disloyalty in this case being ties to the Communist Party. If this sounds unconstitutional, going against the First Amendment, that's because it was. In 1959, Harry Truman would call it the most un-American thing in America today. By 1945, it had become a permanent committee, yet it was seen as a joke, something that wasn't taken seriously. They hadn't caught any communists, the Rosenberg case was still a few years away, and apart from causing a bit of a stir in Hollywood, the start of what would become the Hollywood blacklist, they hadn't done much else either. There was even talk of it being shut down, and there is every chance it would have been had it not been for one member of the committee, the previously mentioned Millhouse, and the case of Alger Hiss. Everything's coming up Millhouse! Alger Hiss was a prominent government official working in the Justice Department under Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt, and later he worked in the State Department. By 1945, he was being touted as a future Secretary of State. In November of 1945, Soviet defector Elizabeth Bentley fingered 150 people, including 37 federal employees, and she fingered them to the FBI. The FBI planned to use her as a double agent. But, 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 this plan was foiled by a certain Mr. Harold Philby of Carlisle Square, Chelsea, London. More on that story later. 
and by later I mean another video entirely. One of those she fingered. There's got to be a better term than fingered. One of those she grasped up was Whitaker Chambers, a fellow defector and an editor of Time magazine. In 1948, Chambers testified before the Un-American Activities Committee and he said there were spy rings within the US government. In particular, what he referred to, one particular spy ring, as the Ware Group. One member of this group, Alger Hiss. According to Chambers, Hiss had given him classified State Department papers in the 1930s. Hiss, unfortunately for himself, was the only member, or supposed member, of this Ware Group who went before the HUAC, the Un-American Activities Committee, to deny the charges and to say that he never met Chambers. Later on, when they were both testifying before the committee together, he said he had met him, but he knew him as George Crossley. Chambers said he'd never gone by that name. And so began a back and forth of denials, retreats, counter charges, counter denials, until Hiss sued Chambers for libel. At which point Chambers produced the secret documents which he was keeping hidden in a pumpkin. They became known as the Pumpkin Papers. Why hadn't he produced these papers to begin with? Well, Chambers said he was trying to spare an old friend. Trying to spare an old friend more trouble than was necessary. Hiss was subsequently put on trial for perjury twice and convicted the second time. All right, James. All right. So you've got this... This case doesn't seem anything exciting, does it? Just a he said, she said, he's a communist, look, here's the secret papers kind of case. So what the hell was so shady about it? The case makes for some fascinating reading, and I would recommend reading up on it, because it is... Actually, when you get into the details of it, a really fascinating case. There are a lot of unanswered questions surrounding it. There's undoubtedly something suspect going on, especially with the whole secret documents thing. And even to this day, we don't know which of them was lying. One of them must have been Hiss Chambers, but we don't know which one. It is unclear. Hiss's denial of Chambers' charges was at first accepted at face value by most of the HUAC. Had things been left there, it's possible HUAC would have folded, derided as a laughing stock. The Red Scare would never have happened, the world would never have heard of Joe McCarthy, and nor, I suspect, would it have heard of this shady motherfucker, Milhouse Nixon. Nixon, Milhouse, the one member of the committee who thought Hiss was lying, and who, according to himself, believed Chambers unconditionally. No objections whatsoever. So Milhouse began to push for further investigation. In his own words, I argued first that turning the case over to the Department of Justice, far from rescuing the committee's reputation, would probably destroy it for good. He justifies himself by arguing that the future of the committee is at stake, or was at stake. He qualifies it by adding that HUAC's collapse would impede the ability of other congressional committees, especially the ones where communism was concerned. At one stage, he actively accuses Hiss of scheming to destroy the committee, 
scheming to destroy chambers and putting the security of the nation at stake. When we read between the lines of how Milhouse describes the case, when we read Milhouse's account, what we can infer is that from his perspective this was less about finding the truth and more about preserving something which was anti-communist, preserving the HUAC. It was entirely selfish. Hiss was Milhouse's scapegoat for the survival of the committee. For Milhouse, Hiss had to be found guilty in order for his precious baby, HUAC, to survive. And we see this again and again in his, in his description of the case. After Hiss identified Chambers as George Crossley, he wrote, The case was broken. The committee would be vindicated, and I personally would receive credit for the part I had played. Never once does Nixon bring up the matter that Chambers 2 was suspect that Chambers 2 might have been lying. He never brings up how strange it was that Chambers refused to admit that he was George Crossley, or he doesn't bring up the many, many contradictions that Chambers brings up during his testimony. And every time, every single time, that it looks like the case will be transferred to the Justice Department, moved out of HUAC's hands, Nixon is right there, trying to keep it in his own hands. Trying to keep it under his personal control. So far, so crooked. But it gets even shadier. A lot shadier. As head of the subcommittee set up to investigate this matter, Nixon was far from impartial. In fact, he was ludicrously biased towards one particular party. Chambers. At one stage, Nixon writes this. I decided to see Chambers again, this time alone and informally. To avoid any publicity, I made the two-hour trip from Washington to his farm by car. We sat on some dilapidated rocking chairs on his front porch, overlooking the Maryland countryside. It was the first of many long and rewarding conversations I was to have with him during the period of the Hiss case. Imagine that this was a criminal proceeding. Imagine that this was a murder case. Something grand, something debauched, something truly horrifying. The most vicious murder you've ever seen. A police officer can't investigate a crime they're connected to. A judge can't preside over a trial if they're friends with the defendant. A juror can't serve if they're known to anyone involved in the trial. All parties in a criminal proceeding have to be neutral, independent, impartial. That's how justice is done. By corresponding with Chambers, by visiting him alone more than once, I'd say that Milhouse Nixon prejudiced the entire case. And he effectively admitted it later on. This is pretty much a confession. And it basically proves that the whole thing was never about finding the truth. It was about finding his guilty, and it was about saving the reputation of the Un-American Activities Committee. <laughs>
Reading through Nixon's account of the Hiss case, it becomes abundantly clear that there is something highly suspicious at play, something crooked. Joan Brady, a writer who personally knew Hiss and has conducted her own investigation into the matter, believes that Nixon personally rigged the case against Hiss. I don't have any evidence myself to prove that he did, but in his own words, by his own words, he definitely acted improperly, if not illegally. And if he did, his motivation, his goal in doing so was clear. Saving the Un-American Activities Committee. Saving something that was anti-communist. And in making sure that Hiss was found guilty, Nixon ensured that McCarthyism would become a byword for witch hunt. Hey, thanks for watching this video. It's been... Oh, it's been one of my favourites to research. If you want to help fund more research, fund more videos in future, fund better equipment, we actually have a uh, lighting now, which is really cool. If you want to help that, we have a Ko-fi page, which is linked in the description down below. And we also now have an Instagram page where I'm posting like historical updates, historical pictures, the occasional reel where I mess about with puppets. And we also have one more thing. A beautiful little magazine available as zine editions, which I'm basically just, you know, dropping around places around town, around like when I go places, so you might be lucky enough to catch one of those somewhere. But if you're not, it's available digitally. Again, link down in the description. There's like little historical essays, galleries, poems, stories, all history related. And the next issue, the September, October 2023 issue, revisiting US politics, <laughs> well, I know who really did it. Do you want to know who really shot JFK? You'll have to read the next issue of Past Force magazine. Sorry.